Hey guys, today we are going to be talking about Andrew Jackson's presidency. He's the seventh president of the United States. We did talk about him today, but just want to kind of do a little review for you, just in case you wanted to watch it over the weekend. So the big things about Andrew Jackson's presidency is the Indian Removal Act, the nullification crisis, and the war on the bank are the kind of the big events for Andrew Jackson and his presidency. So let's get started with some little facts first. <clears throat> some facts about Andrew Jackson. He was known as the common man's president. Remember, common man means kind of everyday kind of guy, okay? No different than you and me, okay? So he was the common man's president. If you were an everyday guy, you would probably like Andrew Jackson. Now, he did believe in a strong national government, that the national government was the supreme law of the land, which means that they were the most powerful. He was a hero of the Battle of New Orleans, which is in the War of 1812. And he changed the way that people campaigned. He threw parties, he did speeches, he did barbecues, buttons, mudslinging, which is name calling. Um, so that was Andrew Jackson. A couple things that's not mentioned on here. Andrew Jackson's a fighter. Okay, He likes to pick fights. He likes to have it his way or it's no way. And he pretty much only listens to himself. So let's see, how did this man get elected? <clears throat> now, one of the big reasons that Andrew Jackson got elected was because there was a change in suffrage requirements. Which, remember, suffrage means voting. So there was a change in voting requirements. Which means, let's think about today. Today, in order to vote, you have to be 18, you have to be a United States citizen, you have to be registered. Those are the requirements. Well, back then, the number one requirement in the year 1800, here on the left, is you have to own land. The problem with this is that the only people who really own land were your really rich people. So really, the only people who were voting were the really rich. But then, before Andrew Jackson runs for president, that all changes. So in 1830, this all changes. And now, in order to vote, you only have to pay taxes, which means you really just have to have a job. So that means more common, everyday people can vote. And who are they going to vote for? They're going to vote for the common man's president, Andrew Jackson. <coughs> now, to get people to vote for him, Andrew Jackson had to do a lot of campaigning, which means talking to people about voting for him, kind of kissing up a little bit. And one thing that he would do is if you helped him get to become president, if you helped him get votes, so like maybe you went out to tons and tons of towns telling people to vote for him. Maybe you were a friend of Andrew Jackson. If you helped him at all become president, he would give you a government job. So even though those people didn't really deserve government jobs, Andrew Jackson would give them the job anyway. Because he was thinking, okay, if you help me, I'll give you a government job. And he would fire or kick out people who had been doing that job for a really long time and maybe really good at it. This little system that he had going to help people who helped him is called the spoil system, and it made quite a few people upset. <clears throat> now, one thing the government did while he was president was they did something called the protective tariff. This is eventually going to cause the nullification crisis. Now, just to remind you what a tariff is, a tariff is to help American factories sell products, stuff that they make. And this is how they do it. On the right here, we have Britain or England. Britain makes cloth, okay, for $3 a roll. Now, when they bring it over to America, they can sell it for $3 a roll, which is a whole dollar cheaper than America's cloth, which means that people from America are going to buy cloth from England, not from America because it's cheaper. But a protective tariff, what it does is it puts a tax on anything that comes into the country. <clears throat> so let's say the tariff was $2. So that would mean that when England brings any cloth over, they have to pay $2 for each roll, two extra dollars for each roll that they bring to the United States, which would make their cloth $5 a roll, which means that it's $1 cheaper than American cloth. So this means, <coughs> <coughs> this means that American cloth would sell a lot more because now it's cheaper. So it really, really helps the factories. The problem with this, it hurts the farmers and the people in the south because they don't have factories and all that's happening is the prices are raising up. So here's a little bit different of a look, a different picture. Maybe it'll help you understand. So it's a tax on imports. It's meant to protect U.S. industries or factories. 
It made imports more expensive and encouraged people to buy products made in the United States. This was good for the North and for factories and bad for the South and farmers. <clears throat> well, one state in the South said, I don't care if this is a law from the national government or not, we're not going to listen. And this state was South Carolina. They kind of become the troublemakers of this time period. South Carolina said, I don't care if the government said this. And John C. Calhoun kind of helped him with this idea and said, South Carolina is not going to do that. They're going to nullify the tariff. They're not going to listen. They're not going to do it. And they're not going to charge a tax for things coming into the country because all it does is make things really expensive. <coughs> so this causes a crisis. Okay, so South Carolina, they refuse to enforce the protective tariff, which another word for this is nullify it. Because they do that, President Jackson, he threatens to use the military to make them do the tariff. Well, when South Carolina hears that he's threatening them, they're like, mm-mm, ain't gonna listen, and they threaten to secede from the Union. They threaten to leave the United States and create their own country. And they were about to leave until Henry Clay comes up with a compromise and says everybody needs to calm down chill out we'll make a compromise and make everybody happy so Henry Clay stops the nullification crisis for going too crazy and saves the day now moving on to the second part of Jackson's presidency he did this thing called the Indian Removal Act so Jackson goes to the Congress and says hey can we create an act or a law that we could trade land in Oklahoma for Native American land in the East. So what he's asking is he's saying, I want us to be able to go to a tribe and say, hey, if you give us your land, we'll give you new land in Oklahoma. And the Congress said, okay, sounds like a good idea. So he starts doing the Indian Removal Act and he starts going to different tribes. He sends people to different tribes and gets them to trade their nice great land for crappy land in Oklahoma. But it doesn't work with all the tribes. So this little Indian Removal Act deal that Jackson had worked for most of the tribes. But when he sent people to the Cherokee tribe in Georgia, the Cherokee were like, we're not doing that. Why would we move? Why would we give, uh, why would we give you our nice land and move to some crappy land in Oklahoma? So they knew what was going on. Well, <clears throat> the state of Georgia really wanted their land, so they kept trying to push them and pressure them to leave. Well, finally, the Cherokee had enough, and they said, you know what, we're tired of you pressuring us. We're going to take you to the Supreme Court. And so in the court case, Worcester versus Georgia, the Supreme Court heard their case, and the Supreme Court sided with the Cherokee. And the Supreme Court said the Cherokee could stay on their land in Georgia, and they didn't have to move to Oklahoma which was good news for the Cherokee. The problem was that Andrew Jackson could care less what the Supreme Court said. So Andrew Jackson totally ignores the Supreme Court. He doesn't care. And he forces the Native American tribe, the Cherokee, to walk all the way to Oklahoma. Okay, that's like 800 miles of walking. So he forces the Cherokee to walk from Georgia all the way to Oklahoma, even though the Supreme Court said that they could stay. So he's ignoring the Supreme Court. He's ignoring the Constitution. He's ignoring checks and balances. Jackson's doing his own thing and acting like a king instead of a president. Now, during this long walk of the Cherokee, about 4,000 of the Cherokee die. One-fourth of them die. And so we call this big walk the Trail of Tears. So the last thing to talk about here is Jackson's hate and war on the bank. Jackson hated the National Bank because he felt like the National Bank only helped the wealthy and the rich. And remember, he's the common man's president. So in order to kill the bank, he does two things. Number one, he vetoes the bank charter. Now a charter is like a permission slip. And in order for the National Bank to run and stay open, it needed a permission slip from the president and from Congress in order to run. So Congress sends them the bank charter and Jackson vetoes it. He says, no, I don't want them to be a bank. They can't run because I'm not giving my permission. The second thing he does is Jackson, <coughs> sorry, 
Jackson takes out all of the money in the national bank and he puts it in the state banks. And without money, a bank can't run. So Jackson officially closes the national bank by taking money out of the national bank and putting it into the state banks and by not giving them permission by vetoing the charter. So as we can see, Jackson's presidency is full of him just doing what he wants to do and not really listening to the Constitution, the Supreme Court, or the Congress. Jackson does his own thing, which makes him kind of an annoying president. But that is the Jacksonian era and Jackson is president.